I said as part of the, um, the introduction that um, <clears throat> it's not very often, particularly when we're talking about the early childhood development um, space, that uh, we give any credence to the, um, the voices of children um, in what we do and the way that uh, we do it. So very much looking forward to um, this session from Professor <coughs> Jeanette Pallier from the Dr. Eric Jackman Institute of Child Study at the University of um, Toronto. Time for you to start, Jan. That means. <laughs> <laughs> Jan has a, um, a long history in working in the, in the field of uh, early child development and educa education with um, ongoing projects in full day uh, kindergartens, early literacy development, family with literacy, parent involvement in education, and play-based language development in Northern Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities. Uh, Jan teaches courses in, in the Masters in Child Study and Education program at the Dr. Eric Jackman Institute of Child Study and supervises Masters and PH students in developmental psychology and education. I've had the, uh, the pleasure of looking a little bit at uh, some of Jan's um, work and listening to her um, over the last days that she spent with it, spent with us um, an enormous intellect uh, and just some incredible new perspectives, Jan, and I'm very much looking forward to you expanding on those in the next hour. So welcome. Thank you very much, Brett. Can everybody hear me? Okay, terrific. So let's begin. So these are some of the children in my family and in my research studies. I'll leave you to guess who's who. So this is, these are a few pictures of Ontario, Canada. So this is the context uh, of the research that I'll be uh, talking about today. The picture on the top right is actually Toronto, and that's our big CN Tower. And uh, beside it to the left is the, what used to be the Sky Dome. I think it's now been uh, bought by uh, a big uh, rich person named Rogers. And um, uh, underneath that, you'll see that um, Ontario is also home to many First Nations people. Um, and there are many of them living both on and off reserve. Um, the bottom left is a picture of beautiful Algonquin Park in the fall when the leaves change color. And the top uh, left is Niagara Falls, uh, which uh, borders uh, with the US. This is the Dr. Eric Jackman Institute of Child Study. It's this fantastic little hub within the University of Toronto where people who are interested in uh, studying uh, children, child development, um, come together as researchers. So we have a research um, wing there. You can't see the whole institute, but that's the front door. The, in the Institute of Child Study has three integrated missions. We, uh, missions. We have a strong Master's of Arts in Child Study and Education program that teaches um, young people to be both teachers and early childhood educators, and they get a master's degree in child study. So it's a fantastic combined program, and many of them go on to do PhD work in child study. There's also a laboratory school for children from three years of age to 12 years of age, and some of the research I do is there in the school, but that's not what I'm talking about today. And then, as I said before, there is a research wing that um, has infrastructure support from a foundation. So I want to give you a little background to what I'm going to talk about today. It really builds on what Jane talked about yesterday. If you were here yesterday and you heard her big picture of what has gone on in Canada in the early childhood context. Um, I'm talking about the provincial context in Canada. So Ontario is one province, and it's one of the provinces that has moved forward on early childhood education and development. The project I'm going to talk about really followed the Toronto First Duty Demonstration Project. So just as Doveton is really a fantastic demonstration project, and it's going to bubble up, um, what happened in Ontario is that that type of endeavor, Toronto First Duty, scaled up and became provincial policy. So now this is this kind of um, context for children is happening across the province. And how it began was with a report by Dr. Charles Pascal, 
who was the early learning advisor to the premier of the province. And the report was entitled, With Our Best Future in Mind, Implementing Early Learning in Ontario. And the first step in doing this, in this implementation, was to offer universal, full-day programs for all four- and five-year-olds. And we call it full-day early learning kindergarten because it built on, as Carl talked about yesterday, the platform of school. So everybody knows school. So now we have in the schools universal services for four- and five-year-olds full-day. We're still working on the rest of the integration. The integration that we saw so beautifully in Toronto First Duty is still underway in the provinces scaling up. So here's the document, the full day early learning kindergarten program draft version. And it's important to note that it's draft because it's always going to be draft. This is one of the goals is that it's constantly being revised and um, informed by research. So the program, the scaling up, is being phased in over five years, and right now we're in the fourth year. So not all children in the province of Ontario yet have access, but almost all. By next year, they all will. So they're fa phasing it in. Um, a very unique piece of this is that the mandate is for a trained early childhood educator and a trained teacher to work together, to come together, different backgrounds, different training, different pay scales, different um, auspices are coming together and planning this high quality play-based program. So that's the other piece is that it is a mandated play-based program. So we, the professional development that teachers are getting, teachers and ECEs are getting together is if, you're, if you've got children sitting in rows and at desks all day, throw that out. Start over with where the children are and what their interests are and follow their play. So this is difficult for many educators. For others, it's not that hard. But working together with a team, in a team, early childhood educators do this naturally. Teachers don't necessarily. So it's been a, a very good mix. Um, it's based on the integrated program of childcare, kindergarten coming together. And some regions in Ontario actually have moved more forward along this continuum of integration in which they have now added the childcare before kindergarten, before the school day and after the school day. So it's all integrated now in a 7 o'clock in the morning till 6 p.m. at night program. So these early childhood educators who are there in the morning work with the daytime team. And then there's a crossover, and there's another early childhood educator who comes in in the afternoon and works with the ECE kindergarten team. So, um, so it's a full integrated program. And we're hoping that more and more regions will be able to start to do this. So the research I'm going to talk about today is called the Peel Research, and that's only because it's carried out in the region of Peel. So it's one very large region in the province of Ontario. And of course, um, they have almost all children now moving into this full day integrated program. And the stakeholders, the regional government, the school boards, even the provincial government, very interested in knowing if this is effective. So the, the, the stakeholders in this region, um, you know, they weren't necessarily thinking, oh, this is going to be successful or not successful. They just really wanted to know how they were doing. They wanted academic outcome data, absolutely. But also, they were wise enough to think that it's not just about academics, it's also about social experiences for children, for families, and for the staff teams. So they wanted to tell the story along the way. And so the research, um, I was fortunate to lead this research. And as a researcher on the Toronto First Duty Project, I, sim I really took that whole research design and applied it to this new context. So I was looking at both the implementation 
of the new program and the impact of it on staff, on parents, and on children. What I was able to do because of the research funding was add a control group. Now, it's not a randomized control group, as Carl was talking about before, because you can't randomly assign children to the school or that school. They go to the school that's in their neighborhood. So it is a controlled study, and you'll see what I mean as I go along. It's longitudinal in that we're following the children from the time they enter the program until right now, until the end of grade three. So just to give you a context for the larger study, and then the, what I'm going to talk about will make more sense. So we've got full day early learning kindergarten. We've got that group of kids. And we still have half day kindergarten children who are traveling to childcare the other half a day, or going home, or wherever they go the other half a day. And so this provides the control group for the new full day group. And as I said, it's longitudinal. In grade three, the province or are, is going to release the standardized test scores for each child. And those individual scores will be added to this database that I have. So we have definitely will have um, scores, outcome data. So it's the same children being followed over four to five years. Um, I'm looking at effects on parents. And Carl talked about the daily hassles questionnaire. That's being used with all parents, control group parents, and full day kindergarten parents. Um, how they make community connections. Um, a piece that I need to add to this is parents' participation in the workforce or going back to school. Like, has that changed as a result of this? I'm looking at effects for staff. So this really relates well to what's going on at Doveton. How do teams become integrated? They're trained differently. They've had separate rooms. They may not even be in the same environment. And now we're asking them to work together as a big team, not just the two educators who are in the classroom together, but the rest of the school the principal, vice principal, how, and the families, how are they all coming together? The data employ both, the data include both mixed um, quantitative and qualitative measures. So really the question is, how do we measure success and how do we tell the story? So just based on Carl's points, I just added these slides in before um, when he was talking actually, um, that we do need to consider demographic differences. Are there differences in the children for whom the program was offered and those who remain in the half-day program? And we need to consider cohort differences when they came in to the program. So I'll just show you a couple of examples. So some children uh, began the full-day program in the first year of implementation, which was 2010 and 11. And some children just began it last year, and some will begin it next year. So if you just look at the difference in maternal and paternal education levels, they are significantly higher for the new group, which means that, yes, the, the uh, province's intention was to place these full day sites in more needy communities. And that is reflected in the demographics of the families. Just looking at the control group, so the control group are the half day kindergarten children and the full day kindergarten. So in both cases, um, mothers and fathers, there's a significant difference in education levels. Another thing to look at, based on what Carl was talking about, is the percentage of English language learners in the control group and full day kindergarten group. Um, so you can see that actually there are more English language learners um, in the control group. Is that right? No, in the full day kindergarten group. Another thing to look at is what is the second, what is the first language of the family? So if, you, if you're looking at the control group, the largest number of 
uh, first language is Cantonese. That's really important because those kids tend to do quite well in school. Whereas the largest group of first language, first language group in the full-day kindergarten is Punjabi. And they tend to not do badly, but not as well as Cantonese-speaking children. So it's just important to consider those things too. Okay, now moving into what I want to talk about today. Hearing from children. We want to know how they're doing. We want to know about their learning, but we also want to know about their happiness, their coping and competence, their self-regulation. So how we measure learning, academic outcomes, vocabulary, getting ratings from educators and from parents, but how do we look at happiness and coping and competence? Well, we can ask children. We can observe them. We can ask parents and educators. And how do we look at self-regulation? Well, I'm going to show you how we've been doing it through observation and a measure, actually, of inhibitory control. This is just an important point that when we do research that involves children, their voices should be heard, really, in program evaluations. We need to hear from the children because their experiences mediate what we're going to see in the outcomes. Just we should just be interested in what the quality of their day-to-day -day experiences are. It's not just about collecting scores, but really finding out about their experiences. So this gives you an example of the number of children. It's actually slightly more than that. Close to 900 children are in this study. And today I'm just going to be talking about 328 from the full-day sites and 264 from the half-day sites. Um, I'll show you all of these measures, uh, but this just gives you an at-a-glance look at the, the number of measures uh, we are using in this study, following them over time. So I'll show you them right now. So the first one is the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. This is not a measure of children's social understanding. This is a measure of receptive vocabulary, and it's a very strong predictor of how children do concurrently in school and how they continue to do in school, the vocabulary test. Um, I also like the expressive vocabulary test, but we have been using this one because it, um, it, it is a strong predictor. Okay, so that a child looks at a plate of pictures like that. The researcher says, which one is cat? Point to cat. And the child can either point or say the number of the plate. We also use a test, another test, of early reading ability. And uh, yesterday I was fortunate to hear from uh, Vicki and others about um, some of the tests that are used here, uh, English online, English online test. And some of the items are very similar to this test of early reading ability. So this has three um, subscales, and this one is the alphabet subscale. So for example, a child would look at this and the researcher would say, point to the picture that starts with the letter C. Another um, subscale is called conventions of print, very similar to Marie Clay's uh, uh, concepts of print idea. So this is point to the name of the story, point to the title. And there are things like, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Is it upside down? Where do you start reading? Where do you end? That type of thing. And then the third subscale is called meaning. And this is to see whether children can derive meaning um, from whatever they have available to them. Um, which one is jello? Like, are they using the, the J in, in jello? Do they know that? Or do they recognize the, um, the label jello? And they get more difficult. We are also using an early writing task. Uh, so this is a published measure to look at how children use whatever they have available to write what you ask them to write. So in this case, uh, it's daddy has three hockey sticks. Now you need to know that hockey is huge in Canada. So everybody knows what hockey is. Might not be um, as popular in other places. So you see the child on the left has drawn a picture of daddy and has also drawn hockey sticks. So he's really conveyed what he, what he can about this. That counts for something. It's not perfect spelling, but it does mean something important. Whereas the child on the, on the right is now starting to use 
her alphabetic understanding to try to sound this out. So we look for this, how they create meaning. It's important. You don't discard it because they're not writing letters yet. It's, it's, in, it's an important point. So we need to look at that trajectory before they start spelling. We also use a number knowledge task. Um, I'm just going to give you a few sample items. So this is very appropriate for very young children. So you put three counting chips in front of the child and say, can you count these and tell me how many there are? So that's the principle of cardinality, being able to count one, two, three, and knowing that the total quantity is three. Um, also introducing math language, which pile has less, which pile yeah, which pile has less by showing stacks of chips? Can they tell just by looking at it? Um, I'm going to show you counting chips that have red and yellow red, yellow, yellow, and ask the child just to count the yellow chips and say how many there are. Uh, and they get more difficult. What number comes two after seven, which is bigger, that kind of thing. And the items get harder and harder as they go along so that the, the test is appropriate for children who are in grade six. Okay, so those are all the kinds of measures, the academic measures. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I just wanted you to know that, yes, they're important. Yes, we include them. But that's not the whole picture. The picture includes children's social experiences and self-regulation. So I'm going to share with you some methodologies that involve interviewing children, collecting their drawings, observing their play, and measuring self-regulation. So here's the first one. A child interview using finger puppets. Now, my mom made these, <laughs> uh, but you can probably buy them. They're just little puppets that fit on the uh, tip of your finger. And I had six, sex, sit, six sets of them made. Um, and the boys all had exactly the same clothing, and the girls had all exactly the same clothing. The only thing that differed was the hair color, eye color, and hair texture. And we actually did record which puppets the children chose. So that's interesting in its own right. So the child was asked to choose a puppet for you and choose one for me. Okay, so there's one of my graduate students, Kadria. She's interviewing Pratmesh. And uh, Pratmesh had chosen the blonde puppet for her. And um, I can't see which one he has for himself. And she says to her puppet, says to Pratmesh's puppet, tell me about your day from the time you leave home until you go home. Okay. So I'm going to read you one example. Now this is from a child who's in the half day in the control group, okay? Not in the full day site, half day. And this child travels to childcare. So I want you to just hear what the child is saying. I wait for Jacob and Noah to get out of Mrs. So-and-so's class so we can get into the car, and then we drive to the babysitter's house, and then we have snack, and then we go to the basement and play, and then we come back upstairs and do some work, and then we wait for our mommy to come, and then we go, Jacob stays at the babysitter's, and me and Noah go to a daycare. Okay, so I think you can sort of pick up what this child's day is like. This is a typical day for this child. Wasn't upset about it. It's just what his day was like. So one way that I can look at these types of what I call scripts, children's scripts, which is kind of a event representations, a chronology of how their day goes, is I can count the number of words, right? How many words do children use? This is a really good measure of productive language. It's not just how many words, but what type of words? What's the syntax like that they're using? What type of vocabulary? Do they use compound words? Are they using metacognitive vocabulary, like think, know, wonder, understand, learn, you know, that kind of thing? Pronouns, are they using pronouns correctly or incorrectly, and what do pronouns mean? So there are all kinds of ways that you can use scripts just to look at language productivity. But you can also look at them, and this is what I've been doing uh, this year, is looking at themes. And one thing I'm very interested in, because we noticed that children in half-day sites versus children in full-day integrated sites, and this includes 
our work with the Toronto First Duty children is that they talk about transitions a lot. So I'll show you the results in one moment. Another way you can use these scripts is look at the growth over time. So if you're doing this with a child in kindergarten, and then again in, sorry, in prep, and then again in grade one and two and three, you can actually look at the child's productive language growth over time. So it's very effective for those of us who also like numbers, right? But themes are, are very important. So here's what we found, and this was a significant difference when you do, test it statistically. Um, I compared English first language and English language learners here, but that's not what the big difference is. The big difference is between the half-day control children and the full-day children. The half-day children mention tra transitions significantly more often than children who are in full-day sites. Okay, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing or a good thing, but they do tell us. So right from the voices of children. Now, following those children, half day and full day, into grade one, I'm now looking at the productive language, counting. So this, I think this is word counts, yeah. So I'm looking at word counts. So it's no longer that they're either in half day and full day sites. So naturally, full day should have longer counts, right? Because they're there all day. No, they're all in grade one. They're all in school for the same amount of time. And the productive language of the children who had been in the full day is significantly higher. I also looked at word counts over three years. And I'm really appealing here to those who, who need to see numbers as well. And uh, I am one of those people, um, but it's not all. Um, just looking at how English first language and English language learners are doing in terms of word count over time. It's great to see that English language learners are really increasing over time. That is fantastic. But they're not, com they're not catching up, at least not at um, not by grade two. They hadn't caught up to um, the English first language children. Okay, so that's, that's just looking at scripts. We also, continuing with our little puppet interview, asked them other social experiences. Like, what's your favorite thing here? What do teachers do or educators? Uh, what's important to learn here? What should kids do if someone starts a fight? if someone wants to play something they don't like, or if someone's crying. So these are all really interesting questions to tap each child's understanding of what's going on in his or her environment. So this is really interesting. And um, a, couple, a couple of my students are, are writing a paper right now on this. What's your favorite thing to do here is play. What's important here is learn. And this just comes across loud and clear. So. For some reason, children think that learning is important, but play is fun. Nevertheless, and I don't have a slide for that, when you compare the children who are in the full day integrated site, they say learning is important less often than uh, children in the half day sites. So in other words, they're starting to say that play is important. Um, what do teachers do? Here's a great example. And I think it teaches us. I share this with my students who are training to be teachers. We show what we've done to them, and they say, excellent. And there's a lot of this kind of um, insight from children. Is that what we want children to think that we do, that we just say, excellent? Can't we make a better comment about what they're doing? So. So then I actually give this exercise to my students and say, if a child comes and shows you something that he or she's drawn, what can you say to that child besides excellent? And it's actually very good training for them. So out of the mouths of children. When we look at just the children in the full day kindergarten, the full day program, let's call it the full day program, 57% um, of the time they talk about play as being the thing they like best. And social, which means you know, talking about friendships, but maybe not mentioning the word play, 
um, takes up another 16%. So, wow, that's such a powerful message. That's what they like. Are we listening to children? This is what they like. This is how they learn. So here's some more questions and some cute examples. So asking the puppet again, why do kids go to school? To play so you can learn stuff because it's fun, because my mom wants me to learn things, because the bus driver takes me, um, which is cute because you're seeing that child's logic in this, or lack of logic, to get teached because it's against the law. And imagine exploring these things with children. What do you like best? And it comes across strongly. Uh, the climber, playing with my friends, playing games, sand, playing in the water, playing in the house, the blocks, toys, playing, snack and learning, play. Play, play, play. It just comes across so strongly. And actually, our provincial government listened to this. And they have mandated a play-based program. And they are trying to offer professional development to teams of educators about what is a good play-based program. And it's really surprising how much learning there is to be done about what is a good play-based program. What don't you like? Nothing. Hitting, people hurting and scratching me, people don't let me play, I don't like fighting, staying long in circles, I can't spell good, the bathrooms, I can't see my mommy and dad. So these are important, and I'll come back to this in a moment. So a major theme from the interviews was the importance of social. What they liked most was play and friendships, and what they didn't like was also related to play, but it was play gone bad and friendships not working. So whether they love it, what they love, and what they don't like are all related to this huge issue of play and friendships. We need to really listen to them. OK, so now I'm going to move on to the drawings. And here's Kadri again working with Alfie. And the children were asked individually, so this was all done uh, one at a time. But you could do it in small groups as long as the children aren't looking at each other's. Uh, draw a picture of yourself doing something here or at school or in childcare, wherever it happens to be, in the early learning center. Uh, this is a little bit hard to see, maybe. So this is how we score it. There are many ways. Again, it appeals to the people who need numbers. Um, we look at themes, so that's not numerical. But we also look at the number of people and objects, the type of emotion portrayed on people's faces. We have a very a detailed and very reliable complexity coding system. So if you just look at, say, number four, drawing complexity number four, this would be given to a, a drawing in which two reference lines are shown and the elements are integrated. So two reference lines might be um, the, the grass on the bottom, maybe the sky coming right down to meet the grass. I mean, that's fairly high level for young children to allow to, to draw the sky right, coming right down to the ground. But two separated reference lines would be the green line at the bottom and the blue line at the top with the sun you know, hanging in the sky, but the people um, in reference to the lines that they've drawn. So there are different ways that you can code this, and it's, it turns out to be very reliable. It's based, again, on Robbie Case's work. We also look at the kind of color they put in it, how much. We look at their face details and the body details, and they get a score along this continuum for the degree of complexity in the um, draw a person, if you will. Okay, so you can get numerical data from children's drawing. But you can also get very important social data. Look at some of these. I'm playing in the sandbox in the water table, so, and, and that's a, an interesting perspective because she's trying to draw two kids at the water table, but she doesn't know how to draw the children up and down. So it's, very, it's just very interesting. You collect samples of this child's drawing over time and see how that changes. Playing Play-Doh, um, again, playing. Playing with my friends at school. Playing with the blocks. Is 
this is big block. I was playing there, but I wanted to go somewhere else, and that's the end. <laughs> I like to play with Wally. Do you see what these drawings are telling us again, just like the interviews? How important play is to young children. It's the blocks. Um, you can also look at the script that they give you because it's very important to gather their story, their narrative about the drawing. It, it's, it's great to have the drawing, but also to get the script. And it, it is also interesting, just as, this is just an aside about the difference between boys and girls' drawings. I, I have noticed a difference, although I don't like to really focus on gender as an issue. But the boys do tend to draw drawings that involve action. Um, often, you know, this, this could be um, that whatever he's just built there, um, playing with blocks, he could be showing action. So he might actually draw over top of that, showing the action of the rocket ship taking off or the, or the flying of the bat. Um, this child hadn't done that, but that's often the case with, uh, with boys' drawings. Uh, building a tower. Now, we collected the drawings from the children every year. So here's an example of a child who's now in grade two. So I can go back and look at his drawings when he was in grade one, when he was in uh, five-year-old kindergarten and four-year-old kindergarten. Um, now, what he's done is he's drawing a picture about the researcher working with him. You're right there, and I'm right here. And this part is me, and I'm telling you what the pictures are. So that was interesting, too. But you can also look at the degree of complexity of this drawing and the reference lines and the, uh, the body details and the face details and all of that. So you can look um, at this quantitatively as well. Now I'm going to move into play observations. So um, I think I have some detail. I, before I go into that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why this is so important. Uh, there's a lot of emerging research about the importance of pretend play in children's self-regulation. And a lot of this comes from Adele Diamond's work, if you know her, or if you don't, she's a good person to look up, um, around working memory. When children are engaged in social pretend play, they have to keep in mind what their role is. And they have to keep in mind what the role of the other players is. And that has to be maintained while they play. So there's a working memory piece to it. There's also an in inhibitory control piece in that if they act out of turn or they screw up the roles or you know they take toys from others and run off, the play's over, right? If they want to keep that play going, they've got to learn to inhibit their uh, responses and to keep within the role. The other thing is play twists and turns and goes off in different directions, and children need to be able to go with that. They need to be flexible. So it's actually been shown to relate to cognitive flexibility. And each of these things, working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility can be tested through external measures. And this is some of the work that Adele Diamond has done. And she has found that children who play more score much higher in all of these areas. So that's why it's important to look at it. So we wanted to know for this Peel research whether instructional times or which instructional times would be related to children's engagement and self-regulation. Because I've noticed, and all my students have noticed, and I actually, I started my career as a teacher, kindergarten and grade one, I know from experience that there are certain times when children pay less attention than others. And so we decided to have a look at this. We wanted to know, first of all, whether whole group time would be more or less difficult, small group time, whether transitions, like moving from one type of activity to another, like moving to the outdoors or changing to snack time if you have a whole group snack time or anything like that, are transitions difficult for children? And 
whether types of play would be related to children's ability to self-regulate, both emotionally and behaviorally. So how we answered these questions. We have now about 60 children, so you can't do this for every child, right? So this is another thing about these kinds of, uh, this kind of data collection. You don't have to do it with every single child if you're trying to get at themes, if you're trying to hear children's voices. You can pick representative samples of children, and that's what we did for this, because this is time consuming. We watched each child, each of the 60 children, during whole group time, small group, during transitions, and during free play time. And we carried out detailed running records. You could video record this, uh, but that's expensive for me as a researcher to do that and, and then transcribe it and code it. So we, I, the poor students had to learn to write fast, and they, we had to get reliability on their observations. Um, Anyway, so we carried out running records, and then we analyzed them. And we've employed a new tool called the Child Observation Framework that was really developed as part of the Toronto First Duty project as it was ending, and, and we, I was moving into this work in Peel. Hard to see what this is, but I just wanted to show you what a page looks like that a researcher would be looking at. So you'd be looking at, you know, who was the observer? And that's really important. Who was the child? What was the context? Whole group, small group, transition, that kind of thing. What was the location, start and end time, that kind of thing. And then who coded it? So it was really important for me to know who did the observations and who coded them too, because we had to have reliability on both of those things. So this is just one example. Um, this is the emotional self-regulation category. So we had three categories, and I'll show you the others in a moment. So for instance, we're looking at a child in whole group. Okay, so this is the whole group context. Um, does the child calm himself when faced with an emotional situation? Yes, no, or that wasn't applicable during your observation. Um, does the child appear comfortable and confident in the learning environment? Uh, doesn't appear overly shy, nervous, or tense, not hesitant to enter uh, play situations. So did that happen or not? Considers other points of views and adjusts one's emotions and behavior. When faced with a challenge, like social, personal, or academic, the child is able to regulate his or her emotions to deal with the situation adaptively or able to work and play independently. So some of these aren't going to apply to a whole group. Uh, but they really would apply to the play situation. So that's the, emo the emotional um, variable of the child observation. A few more examples. So this is from the cognitive. We had cognitive, emotional, and Carl, help me with the other one. Something. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was social. I can't quite remember, sorry. Um, but this is from the cognitive one. So imagining, again, the child sitting in a whole group, and we're looking at these things. Does he shift and focus his attention as required, ignoring distractions? Does he make decisions and choices for himself? Uh, does he persist when faced with a challenge? Does he inhibit impulses? So a lot of these will apply more to the free play context and some will apply to the transition context more, and some will apply to the whole group. But we looked at these things in every context. So here's one finding. I'm taking a whole pile of data here and just bringing it down to one rather important finding. Classroom context that promotes self-regulation in kindergarten, so for four- and five-year-olds, doesn't have to be kindergarten, not whole group. Whole group does not promote self-regulation. Transitions do not promote self-regulation. And this is even more pronounced for boys. But what does promote self-regulation is play and small group time. So this is important for us as educators to know that children are going to pay more attention. We also did um, the same kind of thing for level of engagement. We found the same thing, that children are more engaged in play and small group time. So this is the type of play that we observed. So when we went in and 
watched kids. And you know, I was telling you about how important sociodramatic play is. We didn't see a lot of that. So this is important to give back to the sites, to tell them this is what we're seeing. Often children are engaged in parallel play, playing beside each other, um, but not cooperatively, you know, just playing beside each other. Um, there is also cooperative play that's not sociodramatic play. Um, we worry about children who are often in the unoccupied or solitary categories. Um, because that often means something, and I'll show you in just a moment. Unoccupied, solitary, or just onlooking. They're just looking at other kids, but they're not actually engaging with them. So this is what we did see, is that children who scored higher on the self-regulation, um, both in the task I'm going to show you and in our observations, are the kids who more often engage in dramatic and cooperative play. And the kids who have lower self-regulation are more often unoccupied or in just onlooker play. I don't really know why they call it play when they're just looking, but um, it is considered a category of play. Okay, so that's kind of interesting too, that we see that it might not be the play that makes kids self-regulated. It may be that more self-regulated kids engage in play. Or maybe it is the other way around. Maybe play does encourage the development of self-regulation. So this is something I'm interested in looking at um, as we continue this research. So here's another measure of self-regulation. And this is quick to do. And it's, it's not really looking at children's social understanding again. But I think it's a great measure because it's a game. Children enjoy this. So maybe some of you have heard about the head, toes, shoulders, and knees task. It's really gaining a lot of popularity in North America, and we're using it um, in a lot of different studies. Um, so this is Megan McClellan and Claire Cameron's work out of Oregon State University. Um, they gave me permission to use this task in, in our research. The task shows children's ability to inhibit, inhibit responses and to control their attention and to regulate their behavior. So let me just see what my next slide is. OK. Well, I need to tell you how this task goes. So part one is just head and toes. So you're a child I'm working with, and I say to you, OK, we're going to play a funny game. When I s Let me see you touch your head. Good. Let me see you touch your toes. Good. OK, now here's the funny game. When I say touch your head, I really mean touch your toes. OK, so let's practice. Touch your head. Touch your head. Touch your toes. OK, so they do a few of those. And then they give a trial of 20, I think it's 20, where the chil children or the child, one at a time, um, engages in this. So it is scored. So if I say touch your head, and you touch your head, get zero. If I say, touch your head, and you start to touch your head, but you correct yourself and touch your toes, you get one point. If I say, touch your head, and you immediately touch your toes, you get two points. So that's how the scoring goes. And then after the head and, to head and toes piece is done, we add part two. Now, this was difficult for the children I work with because they're four and five years of age. So now we're going to say, OK, we're going to add a new piece to the game. Touch your shoulders, touch your knees. OK, now when I say touch your shoulders, I really mean touch your knees. And so then you combine them. So you say, touch your head, touch your knees, touch your toes, you know, that kind of thing. So it's harder. Part two is harder. So how I used it and how we did the analysis for this study all the children last year, so all close to 900 of them, participated in this task. So some of them were just coming into the four-year-old or five-year-old full-day program. Some of them were in the in grade, were age six in grade one. Some were age seven in grade two. All of them participated in this. Now, to do the analysis, 
that's tricky. Like for me to compare the kids who had been in the half day program versus the kids who had been in the full day program over time because they're all different ages and whatever. So in order to do this very strict analysis, I only took the new cohort who just came in last year. Okay, so there were four-year-olds and five-year-olds in the full day, and there were four-year-olds and five-year-olds in the half-day program. And there were about um, over 200 of them altogether. So I explained parts one and two. So this is what we found. And I know it doesn't look like a huge difference, but statistically, this is a very big difference. The children who were in the full day program were far more able to control attention, to inhibit responses, and to regulate their behavior. This is a very big finding for us in Ontario. I haven't actually released it to everybody, so you're the first. <laughs> um, but I will be presenting that next week as well. The, because this has been the, one of the mandates of the provincial policy uh, is to increase children's self-regulation. This has been the complaint of many, many teachers over the years and early childhood educators that kids can't regulate their behavior and their emotions. And if we're seeing that children who are in full day high quality programs are able to do this a lot better than children who are in half day or mixed kind of day programs, this is telling us something, maybe not just about the length of time, but maybe about what they're doing in that length of time. They're engaged in more sustained, high-quality play, for instance. They don't have to rush. What you'll, I don't know if I'm presenting this here. Um, we'll see. Um, but the children who are in the half-day programs mention that academics are really important more often than do kids in the full day program. And that's because educators have to cram in a lot of stuff into a half day program, right? Whereas when the children are in a stretched out, high quality program that's facilitated by an early childhood educator with that great play training and a kindergarten teacher who's getting a lot of professional development jointly with this, you know, kids are getting lots of high quality extended play in which the research by Adele Diamond and others suggest, promotes self-regulation. So this could be a very promising finding. OK, so I'm almost done here. A final way that I'm going to report on ga gaining information about children's development is from parents. Now, again, this isn't asking children, but it is asking important stakeholders about their child. And so parents were asked to just complete a very simple rating scale, just three, uh, three um, indices. Is your child less ready than other kids his age, about the same, or more ready in these areas? Small muscle, and there's an explanation of what that is. Large muscle, getting along with other children, with adults, general knowledge, letter sound knowledge, number knowledge, and speaking. So parents should know their kids fairly well, but maybe they don't know other kids that well. But anyway, the findings were still very interesting. Because what we see is that without, without knowing children in control groups or half-day kids, full-day parents rated their children higher in really every area, and some of these areas were significantly higher, like small muscle, general knowledge, letter sound knowledge, and number knowledge. So, hey, that sort of goes along with the other findings. And I didn't present to you vocabulary and reading and number knowledge. I didn't present that today. But this is consistent with some of the other data that we have been collecting. Now, if you just look at parents' ratings of social development, getting along with children, other children, and getting along with adults, again, you can see that they rate their children higher in the social domain. So, summary of today, listening to children. Children's voices remind us of why we're here, what we're doing, whether we're a PhD student 
starting to collect data, thinking about methodology, whether we're practitioners, whether we're leaders in the school, whether we're executive principals, whether we're government people, um, teachers, children's voices remind us of how important our work is. So from their interviews, to recap, we heard about transition. We heard that play and socialization are important. The interviews provide naturalistic, productive language data, too, if we want to actually measure it. From their drawings, we learn that play with friends is most important. But drawing data can also be used for levels of complexity, emotionality, and theme. From our observations, we learned that children are less engaged and less self-regulated in whole group settings, and they're more engaged in play in small group. We, know, we see that dramatic play happens to happen more often with children uh, who are self-regulated and unoccupied or just onlooker by children with lower self-regulation. Um, we, the observations that children are engaged in sociodramatic and pretend play only 15% of the time. Now that's just a small sample, right, of 60 kids. But still, it's important to feed that back to educators. Maybe what we need to think is that we need to expand our definition of what kind of play fosters self-regulation. Maybe it isn't only sociodramatic play. Or maybe we need to encourage educators to set up context for, for sociodramatic play. We learned today about research tasks like the head, and tolder, head, toes, and shoulders, and knees task can help us to fill in the picture of self-regulation beyond what our observations are telling us. And from parents, we can gain great insight into children's social and academic readiness because they know their children better than anyone. So that's it. Um, these are our little junior kindergarten children at our lab school, trying to line them up for a photograph. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for listening.